said this. They said that the abolition movement, a movement to abolish slavery, had been there prior to the 1830s. Because on Thursday, we kind of said, well, look, in the 1830s, there was this renewed movement to abolish slavery um, that we call the radical abolition movement. And um, then we said, but before that, there was a uh, movement to abolish slavery, but it was different. The movement of the 1830s was different than the, the, the initial movement to abolish slavery. We said, as late as the 1790s, there were people out there, there were organizations that were formed for the purpose of abolishing slavery, but they changed in the 1830s. How so? Does anybody remember? If I, would, if I was to say this case, early abolition movements had three things in common, what would they be? Say it uh, uh, Oh, wait a minute, stop. I want to emphasize it. You are saying that the early abolition movements wanted to gradually abolish slavery. One. What else? Ah, uh, and may I stop you again, Kate? And they, they, do, they wanted uh, to compensate the owners, right, for the, for the slaves they lost. And what was the third part? They wanted to send the slaves back to Africa. Recolonization. So early abolition movements included radical emancipation with compensation and colonization. Oh, darn it, Elaine, what was the name of that organization that formed in 1817 that was set up for the purpose of recolonization of liberated slaves back to Africa? Do you recall, dear Elaine? Oh, Jim recalls he very bright. Dr. Paul. <laughs> That was quite a feat to get that out. The American Colonization Society was the name of that, 1870. And we mentioned that, that all these prominent people, like Henry Clay and James Monroe, the president of the United States, was involved in this organization, the American Colonization Society. And they actually even acquired a colony, Liberia, for the purpose of, uh, on the east, east coast of Africa, or the west coast of Africa, for the purpose of recolonizing you know, liberated slaves. Uh, this never works. And in the, in, the, in the failure of the American Colonization Society results in kind of, of a change in abolition. By the late 1820s and early 1830s, the abolition movement changed. And Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison's liberator, and Garrison's position in that liberator embodied the change in the abolition movement. What did Garrison say that represented a departure? What did Garrison say that represented a departure? Abigail, do you recall our discussion of, of William Lloyd Garrison on Thursday? Did you recall the Liberator? Right? His, 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 his bank or his, his newspaper. Do you recall our conversation on Thursday? What did he say? What was so different? Go ahead, Craig. He wanted to be abolished. Ah. So he wanted slavery, slavery to be abolished immediately. How about compensation? No compensation. How about colonization? No colonization. No compensation, the immediate abolition of slavery, because Garrison said that slavery is an inherent evil. It's wrong. It's a sin. It should be stopped immediately. So we call Garrison and others like him immediatist, because they wanted to immediately abolish slavery without compensation and without colonization. Now, I mean, Garrison's liberator probably isn't absolutely the first movement in this direction, but it's kind of an important symbol, right? It's kind of an important symbol. I mean, it's January 1st, 1831, the Liberator is published, Garrison is kind of on the map, you know, this is the informal beginning of the radical abolition movement. Now, in the aftermath of that, abolition picked up. More people, you know, formed organizations that advocated for the immediate abolition of slavery. And I think we said in class, by 1835, there were 2,000 such organizations. And I think we said in class on Thursday that 2,000 such organizations were bound to come to conflict. You know, there were lots of people that joined lots of organizations that were committed to the abolition of slavery. And we mentioned some of these organizations and we mentioned some of the people. We talked about Frederick Douglass, we talked about Theodore Dwight Well, we talked about Sojourner Truth, we mentioned these names of people that are considered to be prominent abolitionists, and we probably mentioned that these organizations began to quarrel with one another. They had different ideas. Some of them thought that, that look, you know, um, we should incorporate with the, the idea of abolishing slavery the idea of women's rights. And others said, oh, no, no, that's somebody who wants. And some didn't want women to even be involved in positions of leadership, others did. Then some thought, well, we shouldn't become involved in politics, and others did. And so they quarreled amongst each other. But the, the, the movement to abolish slavery in the North grew. 
However, and then I want to make this clear, never, ever, ever was abolition a majority movement in the North. The overwhelming majority of people in the North did not support the immediate abolition of slavery. It is a misconception to think everybody in the North wanted slavery to be immediately abolished and everybody in the South did not. That is not true. Most people in the North were not abolitionists. In fact, most people in the North would be insulted if you called them an abolitionist. No legitimate politician embraced abolition. Now, that doesn't mean that the abolition movement didn't exist. It did. That doesn't mean that it didn't grow. It did. But it was never, ever, ever, ever a majority movement. Now, that being said, what we want to talk about now is, okay, here is this minority movement that's, that's grown. Right? How did the South react? and how did the North react? Now, we know this. We know that, that, that most Northerners didn't embrace it. But we're going to go further than that in a second. But first, we're going to talk about how did the South respond to abolition. Now, as you might expect, the South responded to abolition um, defensively. You know, they, they, they were defensive. And to some extent, um, the, the piece we read by Calhoun, where he defended slavery as a positive good, was a response to the abolition movement. I mean, Calhoun in 37 is going to give that speech where he says, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Slavery is not a necessary evil. It's a positive good. Right? So, so the South's position on slavery is going to change to some extent as a result of the abolition movement. But beyond just kind of you know, being challenged, the abolition movement challenges the, 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 the Southern institution, which is so important to them, slavery. Um, there were other things that caused Southerners to dig in, and that's what they're going to do. In response to the abolition movement, they were going to dig in and shut off debate on, on the, the, the issue of, of, of slavery. And, 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 you know, this is always said, you know, in the aftermath of the abolition movement, you couldn't be an abolitionist in the South. You couldn't publish an abolitionist article. You couldn't have an abolitionist meeting. Um, the Southern Postmasters opened the mail and destroyed abolitionist literature that was sent down there. The gag rule was pushed in the House of Representatives by Southerners, right, who wanted to, to, to muzzle any kind of debate in the U.S. Congress about slavery. And the South shut down any discussion of abolishing slavery in the aftermath of the emergence of the radical abolitionism. But there were um, reasons for that. Well, one was this. One of the big things that contributes to the Southern response to abolition is something called Nat Turner's Rebellion. Nat Turner, and Nat Turner's Rebellion is August of 31. Nat Turner was a slave. He was a slave. And he had a fairly kind of benevolent slave experience. He was a slave in Virginia. And Turner was a house slave. Right? So he was like a servant in a in a house, and he had a pretty benevolent master that was kind of what you would describe as being kindly. So if there could be a good slave experience, Turner had it. Right? He had a good slave experience. He was unusual. He could read and write. It was illegal to teach slaves how to read and write in the South. But, you know, there were some that could read and write. Turner was one of them. And Turner was a, a, a leader. He was a slave leader. He was a, a minister. There were slave churches, and he was administering, and preaching, and taught. And, you know, I mean, so Turner was well known in the slave community. Well, in August of 31, Turner claimed that he got a vision. Actually, the vision was before that. That he got a vision that God had chosen he, Nat Turner, to lead a race war. A war between the slaves and their white masters that would eventually end the institution of slavery. So he and some of his followers, in August of 31, took machetes. And I'm pretty sure this is true. They started with Turner's master, his wife, and his children. And they chopped them to pieces with machetes. And then, including a baby and a pregnant. And then, from there, they went to the next plantation and did the same thing. And slaves joined them. And then they went to the next plantation and did the same thing. And this lasted for days. For days, there was this kind of brewing slave rebellion as Turner and his band went from plantation to plantation. Well, eventually, you know, the word of this got out, and they formed a militia, and there was a battle, and Turner's forces were defeated, but Turner escaped. And he kind of was at large for, I think, a couple of weeks. He 
was finally captured and he was tried and he was executed. But whose fault was that Turner's rebellion? Where does it come from? Right now, you know, you, you see this, the, the South is defending slavery as a, as, as a positive good. They're basically saying, hey, everybody's happy with slavery. The slaves are happy, the masters are happy, everybody's happy with slavery. Well, if everybody's happy with slavery, how come this guy's macheteing people? Right? How many people typically don't do that, right? They don't machete their neighbors. They don't do machete. I mean, now, why is that? Well, what's this coming from? So who do we blame for Nat Turner? Now, it would be convenient to say, well, I was crazy. Right? But here's what they said. Look, the liberator in all of this abolitionist sentiment starts in January of 31. It was these ideas that caused Turner to do this. It was this abolitionist sentiment that seeped from the North into the South. And so now, with Nat Turner's rebellion, abolition wasn't just something that would destroy their economic well-being. Now what Southerners were saying is the safety and security of our homes are jeopardized by this idea of abolition. That what these abolitionists are inciting in our slaves is a rebellion. Now, and there was nothing that white Southerners feared more than a slave rebellion. Because they were vulnerable. There you are. You're on a plantation and you have 300 slaves. Right? What are you going to do? If those 300 slaves turn against you, what are you going to do? I mean, you might be able to kill some of them, but eventually they're going to kill you. You're sleeping at night. The slaves are in your house. Right? They're taking care of your children. Now, you're vulnerable to, to, to this. And so, if these ideas can encourage someone like Nat Turner, who had a fairly benevolent slave experience, to react like that, then what could they do to the rest of the slave population? We just can't have this. We've got to stop it. It's not about free speech. It's not about democratic principles. It's about the safety and security of our families. So in the aftermath of, uh, of Nat Turner's rebellion, the South shuts it down. Look, in 32, kind of the, the, the end of it, in terms of the discussion of, of the abolition of slavery, is in, in 32, the state of Virginia, in the legislature of the state of Virginia, the legislature, in response to Nat Turner, debates actually abolishing slavery. They said, well, you know what? Maybe the best way to prevent this from happening again is to just eliminate slavery. Let's go for a gradual abolition of slavery with compensation. Let's do it. You know, there were, there were people actually in Virginia that wanted to move to abolition. Right? And they, they debated it. And they voted. And the vote was very narrow. Narrowly, right, they defeated a proposal to abolish slavery in Virginia in 32. In the aftermath of that, discussion was shut down. They put a price on Garrison's head in Georgia. And you said, you bring this guy down to Georgia, we'll give you $5,000. Because he is guilty of murder, exciting slave rebellion. And that was punishable by death in the state of Georgia. So in the aftermath of Nat Turner's rebellion and the Virginia debate, conversation about the abolition of slavery in the South was shut down. Now, in 33, to make it even worse for Southerners, Britain abolished slavery. In their colonies as well. And so now the white South seemed increasingly isolated from the rest of the civilized world. And that's when they really dig in and defend slavery as a positive good. Now, the response of Southerners to slavery is not surprising. Right? It's not surprising. But in the North, most people were not abolitionists. And many people were overtly hostile to abolition. Not just just. Not, not just abolitionists, but they were hostile to it. In 1835, there was at least 50 riots by people who were rioting against abolitionists. Garrison was drugged through the streets with a noose around his neck in Boston. Eli Lovejoy, who was an abolitionist uh, um, newspaper editor, had his printing press destroyed three times. The third time they destroyed his press, they killed him. He was killed by an angry mob. So in the North, there was hostility towards abolition. Right? Hostility towards it. And this is sort of interesting. Now, I'll say this. If you were an average Northerner, and I picked the city of Scranton, because of Mrs. Jury, who's from Wilkesboro, which is right next to it. So if I was an average American living in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in 1835, I would not be an abolitionist. If that were true. 
Black Lives just picked an average American, pulled them up, said, hey, are you an abolitionist? That person would more than likely say no. And it would not be unlikely that they would not only say no, but they would be hostile to abolition. Actually hostile to it. Now, equally likely, they would say this, but I'm against slavery. I am. So you're saying, if I pull a guy, Bowman, the average person, a guy from his house in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I say to this guy, um, are you an abolitionist? He said, absolutely not. And it's possible that he might shake his angry fist and say, I'm definitely not an abolitionist, and those people are troublemakers. All right? But if I said, do you think slavery is wrong? He'd probably say, yes, I do. I think slavery is immoral. Wait a minute. So you're saying that most Northerners thought that slavery was inherently wrong, but they were against abolition to the point of hostility. What explains this? Um, is, is, is our friends are coming in from the Hispanic generation. What explains this? So let me give it to you again. Most Northerners thought slavery was a moral evil, thought it was wrong, right? But they were not abolitionists, and in fact, might have been hostile to its abolition. What explains that? Crud has a thought. Let's see what it is. They didn't want competition in their jobs. Oh, so you are saying there may have been some people in the North who were, um, who saw the abolition of slavery as being something that might be deleterious to their economic interests. Is, is that what you are saying? So you are saying, um, now it's interesting you say that to your because some of the most vocal anti abolitionists, anti abolitionists, with the Irish. The recent immigrant, first generation and recent immigrant Irish who were in the port cities in the Northeast, they were some of the most vocal opponents of abolition, hostile against ideas of abolition, more than likely because they feared four million free slaves would come and take their jobs, right? You know, uh, compete with them for their jobs. So sure, yes, there were some people that were against abolition for that overt economic reason. Why else? Why else? Yes, go ahead. Oh, so you're saying they, they, they just kind of go along with um, what most people believe. They didn't want to be the... Uh, I, I, but I'm more interested in why there's an angry mob than, than people not wanting to be hurt by an angry mob. Why is there an angry mob in the first place that would speak so passionately against abolition? If most people... Because I'm, what I'm saying to you is most people thought it was wrong. Why would they be so passionately against the proposal to immediately abolish it if they thought it was wrong in the first place? Your, your competition for jobs makes sense. Why else? Um, perhaps I think that would cause conflict with the South. Oh. So what you are saying to me is that some people might have feared that a movement towards abolition would have disrupted the Union and might have resulted in a civil war. After Calhoun said, look, if you go, did Calhoun say, abolition and Union cannot coexist. Right? We can't have both of these. Do you think there are people that say, well, look, we don't like slavery, but we don't want to pursue something that breaks up the union. Go ahead, dear Abigail. Uh, uh, Muslim more that we don't uh, stop the North Pardon me? Uh, oh. So what you are saying to me, Abigail, is that cotton was an important cash crop that extended beyond the borders of the South. That Southern cotton was used in Northern textile mills. And that northern bankers finance southern cotton, and northern shippers ship southern cotton, and northern insurers insured southern cotton. And all of them were in the cotton business and didn't want the cotton business disrupted with a conflict over slavery? Is that what you are trying to say to me? Well, that's good too. Go ahead, C. C has a thought. You were to say the same thing. Well, yeah. I mean, there were those that, 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 that had a vested economic interest in the status quo and didn't want to disrupt it. Those were there, there were those who feared for their jobs and didn't want them challenged. Those were those who feared for the union and didn't want it uh, disrupted. So there were those out there that said, man, this is a bad thing, slavery. This is a bad thing. But you abolitionists, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Don't bring this up. This is going to destroy the union. This is going to destroy our business interests. This is going to destroy, you know, our livelihoods. Shut up. This is Northerners saying this. I'm going to tell you one of the people who may have said that, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln 
thought that the, the abolitionists were dangerous. He thought that abolition would extend slavery, not shorten it. He was not an abolitionist and never was an abolitionist. Now, that's, that's interesting. That, that, that abolition had such um, a response to it. But it raises an interesting question, too. And basically, what I'm saying to you is, I say, well, look, most people in America had no desire to abolish slavery. Well, is that true? Absolutely. There were Northerners who thought it was wrong, but they still didn't have a desire to abolish it. There were Southerners who thought it was a positive good. They didn't have a desire to abolish it anyways. Well, so then, what's the problem here? What, what, why does this result in a conflict? If, every, if there's almost a consensus, except for a small group of radical abolitionists that were easily dismissed, frankly. You know, I was reading this article, Nothing Happened to Me Either, when I was, and that was actually a book I was reading. So I was reading this book, you know, and nothing, it was no pain. No pain, no pain, no pain at any time when I was reading this book. But I was reading this book that compared the abolitionists of the 1830s and 1840s to the hippies of the 1960s. They said that the abolitionists of the 1830s and 1840s, beyond supporting abolition, had kind of other bizarre sort of ideas that they adhered to. You know, um, and so this was kind of a fringe group. And so what's, what's, what's the problem here? How does this make Well, the answer to that question is expansion. It's not necessarily that, that, that people wanted to abolish slavery in Georgia. But the question became, what if slavery is going to spread to Kansas? Now what? What if slavery is going to spread to California? Now what? So we can agree this is a bad, we don't not agree, but in the North, we can all agree in the North is a bad thing, and most people did, right? Agree that it was a bad thing. And if it's a bad thing, should it spread? And are there other implications to that? And so it is not the abolition of slavery that becomes the issue. What becomes the issue is the extension of slavery. And the extension of slavery becomes a political issue, which takes us back to the conversation of politics. So let's go back to that. When we left politics, we left it with the election of 1840. Does anyone besides Jim and myself remember who the presidential aspirants were in 1840? Uh, as Jim, you are lucky to see here, remembers who the presidential aspirants were in 1840. See, tell us. Van Buren was the incumbent president who was seeking re-election in 1840. Was he not? What political party was he associated with? He was a Democrat. And who was challenging him from the Whig party? D. Harrison. William Henry Harrison was challenging him from the Whig party. So it was Van Buren versus Harrison in 1840. Now, we know Van Buren. We know that Van Buren was a confidant of Jackson. He had been Jackson's vice president. And we know that Van Buren had been elected president and had kind of been burdened with a serious problem. Matt, do you recall the serious problem that, that Van Buren had been burdened with in his administration, which hurt his popularity? Do you recall? Uh, 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 to, do you recall? I mean, there was a big thing, 1837? The panic. The panic. The Panic of 37 was a severe economic downturn or recession, and Van Buren was in office during this, and it may not have been his fault, it may have been his fault, we discussed that a little bit, but Van Buren obviously is associated with economic hard times, right? So, so naturally the Whigs are going to say that the democratic policies have created these problems, and you should vote for us in 1840 and you'll be better off. And they nominate William Henry Harrison. Harrison is 68 years old at the time of his nomination. He's the oldest person to be elected president to Reagan. Right, so he's 68 years of age. Um, and Harris had, had, had been one of, the, one of the Whig candidates that had run in 36. Remember they ran three or four candidates in 36? Harrison had been one of them. And he had kind of done the best of all the people that had run. So Harrison had run for the presidency in 36, among other Whigs who had run that year. Remember he said they ran more than one candidate to try to with the election in the House of Representatives. Um, and he was a warrior. I mean, Harrison had, he had a nickname. That's great because Jackson had a nickname. His, Jackson's nickname was Old Hickory. Uh, Harrison had a nickname. His was Old Tippecanoe, right? So, so Old Tippecanoe had a nickname. He was a warrior. Get it? The Whigs were kind of going to try to out Jackson Jackson, right? The Jacksonians had swept into office with their hero, Andrew Jackson. He had been a war hero, didn't have a definite record of policy. Harrison didn't either. 
I mean, Harrison had served in various offices at times. He had been the territorial governor of Indiana. He had served in the military. But he wasn't a player. You know, he was no Henry Clay. Henry Clay wanted the, the nomination of 40. But the Whigs kind of decided, well, we're going to go for kind of the Jacksonian Whig. William Henry Harrison, a war hero, doesn't have a real strong political record, man of the people. And that's what they said. They said, our guy is a man of the people. You know, he's just an old-fashioned, typical American who, you know, wears flannel clothing and, you know, is a frontiersman. And, and you know, the Democrats mocked him. They said, oh, I guess he would be happy on the porch of his log cabin with hard cider in his right. They called it the hard cider campaign for, for Harrison. And they said, and incidentally, your boy Van Buren, he's an aristocrat. He's a, he is an aristocrat. He is a, a, someone who had, has a privileged existence. And, you know, he is, he is he's privileging at the expense of the people. Now, what was interesting about that whole campaign is nothing could have been further from the truth about both candidates. Harrison had never lived in a log cabin. His family was a wealthy family from Virginia. And he had lived on a large plantation with a lot of slaves in his entire life. So Harrison was never, ever, ever poor. He was never a hard cider frontiersman ever. Van Buren, on the other hand, was in fact poor. He was never an aristocrat. He was somebody who grew up from modest beginning. But that didn't matter. The campaign was turbulent. It was an issueless campaign. You know, the Whigs kind of strayed away from taking a position on any kind of issues largely because the only thing that unified the Whig Party was hatred for Jackson. Um, is the highest voter turnout? Oh, I found another number on that poll. 18, or 80.2 percent, the source I was reading last night, 80.2 percent of eligible voters went to the poll in that election, and Harrison was elected. He was elected for the presidency. And not only was Harrison elected for the presidency, defeated um, uh, Van Buren, right, defeated Van Buren, it, 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 uh, not only did that happen, but the Whigs won the House and the Senate. So the Whigs took over the national government. The House, the Senate, they won the presidency. Now, Harrison, age 68, carefully writes a lengthy inaugural address, one hour and 45 minutes. He does this for two reasons. One reason is he wants to prove to people he's not old. Because this was a campaign issue. And the Democrats said, hey, that guy's too old to be president. Right? He's 68. He said, no, he's too old. No one else has ever been that old. He's way too old. He's going to be not energetic enough. So he wanted to prove to them, hey, look, I'm not too old. I'm going to deliver this inaugural address, which is an hour and 45 minutes. Okay. The other thing he wanted to prove is that he was a capable intellectual. So he personally wrote this speech, personally wrote a speech, that had all of these things in it, and he's going to deliver it for an hour and 45 minutes. The day he delivered it, he delivered it outside. It was kind of a bad day. And we all know the story of what happened to Harrison shortly after his inaugural address. His administration got underway. He became ill, seemingly caught a cold, which turned into pneumonia. Four weeks later, he was dead. Harrison served about 30 days as president of the United States. He was the first president to die in office. Right? This is the first time this had ever happened. Nobody knew what to do. I mean, this guy died, now what? Well, who's his vice president? His vice president was a guy named John Tyler. Right? In fact, during the campaign, they would say this, Old Tippecanoe and Tyler II, right? And Tyler II was a Virginia Whig. But Tyler was a disciple of John C. Calhoun. And he was only a Whig because he hated Jackson over nullification. So the nullification crisis, you know, had caused many, many, many states' rights Democrats to abandon the Democratic Party, and they went to the Whig Party. But they only went there because they, everybody in the Whig Party hated Jackson. So ideologically, Tyler didn't really believe in the agenda of the National Republicans, in the kind of hidden Whig agenda. I mean, the Whig agenda was the agenda of Henry Clay. He was the big. Get it? Uh, Henry, Henry Clay, I mean, that's the kind of humor you don't get in other classes. I'm out of company. Right? Yeah, so, so Henry Clay was the big wig, right? And Henry Clay was the national system, you know, the, the, you know, the, uh, the American system. He wanted high tariffs, he wanted a national bank, he wanted internal improvements, and he believed that he had it. We got a wig president, we got a, a wig house, we got a wig senate, and so Clay starts to send off 
Um, what is it? Okay. Uh, so Clay um, sends to, um, to, to through the through the House and the Senate legislation to start a national bank. Tyler Vito. Yes. Yes, John Tyler. Yeah. Tyler Vito. Twice the Whigs in Congress sent legislation to start a third bank in the United States. Twice Tyler Vito. They sent legislation to raise tariffs. Tyler Vito that. Tyler was so antagonistic against the Whig agenda that every single member of the Harrison cabinet that had been appointed by Harrison quit Tyler's cabinet, except for Daniel Webster, who was involved as the Secretary of State and involved in some negotiations. And then, in 1842, um, um, the Whigs got together and literally kicked Tyler out of the party. The Whig caucus got together in Congress and said, that man is no longer a Whig. They kicked him out. So, so the Whigs, at, their, at the peak of their popularity, when they thought they were going to get their agenda passed, were thwarted by Tyler and they were frustrated with this. But Tyler was in a political jam. And Tyler's political jam was this. He had alienated the Whig party that, that had made him vice president. They surely were going to nominate him in 44. The Democratic Party, maybe they might nominate Tyler, but they weren't nuts about him too because he was a Whig. So Tyler sought to, to kind of deflect attention from these big issues, the issues of, of bank and internal improvements and tariffs, by raising another issue, expansion. What Tyler hopes to do is make national expansion the issue in the 44 election. And Tyler was an expansionist. By 1844, by the time the presidential election of 44 was, was coming around, there, were, there was lots of places that America's interest and influence were expanding into. In fact, a notion which was, was beginning to pervade at the time was given, given um, um, kind of a name by a guy named John O'Sullivan manifest this. What Sullivan said is the mindset of many Americans by 1844 and into 1845 was, it is the destiny of America to spread its interests and its institutions and its values and its ideals and its economic system from Atlantic to Pacific. Right? Manifest destiny. Let me pull down a map here. Yeah. Um, and by 1845, when Osullivan coins that term, by 44, the election of the war, the idea that was beginning to pervade largely with Democrats is it is the destiny of America to spread. It is the destiny for our institutions and values to spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Now you might say, well, how does this become an issue? Well, it becomes an issue in two areas, Oregon and Texas. That's where the issue of manifest destiny becomes, comes to a head. What should we do about Oregon and what should we do about Texas? Let's point out on the map both Oregon and Texas. Oregon and Texas. Now let's talk about Oregon first. By 1844, there were about 5,000 Americans in Oregon. In 1841, there were four, 500. Now look, look, look about this uh, area. This is Oregon. All this territory here, this was the Oregon territory. So what we're saying is, in 1841, look at that. Look at the instructor's finger. Look at the instructor's finger. All this area, 500 Americans. That's it. All right. Then, from 41 to 44, Americans, as a steady stream, traveled and migrated to Oregon. Guess how they got there, you'll never guess. On the Oregon Trail, right? They got, did you still play that stupid game in uh, elementary school? Did you still do that? The Oregon Trail. Bolo, did you do that at Pickering Elementary? I did. Even at Pickering. Yes. <laughs> right? Uh, Jim, did you play the Oregon Trail? Is it your favorite thing in the whole world? Uh, yes. The Oregon Trail. Um, yes. Uh, that's how they got there, on the Oregon Trail. I, I think I was reading somewhere. I think they went at like one or two miles an hour. Can you imagine that? How slow that is? One or two miles an hour from here, like St. Louis, 
right, to Oregon at one mile an hour? Of course it is. Well, it took five or six months. Well, no kidding, right? It took, I mean, this, see these great planes here? They're flat, but it's all uphill. Um, because you get into the Appalachian Mountains and you can cross the Appalachian Mountains and the Willamette Valley that's here, and people went there in large numbers, right? About 5,000 and so on. And the deal with Oregon was this. The deal was that Oregon was to be jointly occupied. Britain and the United States couldn't agree on a border, so we said we'll just both be there. There's not enough people to fight about. Now there were 5,000 Americans. And now this feeling of manifest destiny. This idea that America was destined to spread its institutions, its values, its traditions from Atlantic to Pacific comes into the picture. And people like Tyler and others said, look, this should all be ours. We claimed it with our families. It is our destiny to spread our institutions and values. It's, it's kind of the notion of American exceptionalism. Now, I mean, this notion of American exceptionalism, that we are a special people, right? That we are a special people, that we're different people inherently kind of suggests that that specialness is better, right? And if you think about it, there are lots of examples of that. You know, I mean, the city on a hill. You know, winter city on a hill. We're going to be a beacon. We're going to show the world what the way it can be. You know, that's the idea of American exceptionalism. So this idea of American exceptionalism is, is out there, and it comes to kind of full fruition with manifest destiny. Incidentally, that's why they hate us in the rest of the world. You know, and the rest of the world hates us because of that. You know, and they will admit, you know, that they hate us, but they do. Right, you know, uh, they think it's because of these notions of manifest destiny, right, you know, and, and ideas of American exceptionalism. But regardless, it brings to the to a head, you know, the idea of the annexation of Texas or uh, annexation of work. It, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Fifty-four forty. Fine. Now, one last thing before we move. The other area is Texas. Okay. At the time the election of forty-four went on. Texas was an independent country. Now, Texas had been a part of Mexico. Now they were an independent country that some people wanted to annex into the United States. And I'm not talking about an independent country. We're talking about just that, an independent, recognized, independent country. Right? And expansionists wanted to, to, to expand and, and, and annex Texas and take all of war. And this becomes a big issue in the election of 44, which we are going to talk about tomorrow. All right, that will be on the YouTube if you want to watch it, Jin, uh, on our page, right, for, for tomorrow. So there you go.